Big Red Book, page 547. 547. This morning, and we're going to do this evening. We'll glorify you and, and bring honor to you, Lord. I pray that you be with Tim tonight, give him the words to speak that uh, we can hear and understand and apply it to our lives. These things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Page 469.
stepping up again, Jerry. We appreciate that. You and Jared make a pretty good pair. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you sung together before. Probably quite a bit. Hope you guys have had a, had a great day. I've enjoyed the day. It's been a beautiful day. I just want to ask a question. Or make a, one, one word, flies. Is anybody having problems with bunches of flies other than me and Jill? You need some? <laughs> no, I've got the lion's share right now. Uh, Friday night, the whole back side of our house was just covered with flies, and, and we were in and out and putting cleaning windows, putting screens in, and, and we managed to allow, oh, I don't know, probably a couple hundred of them in, and uh, we have been fighting them ever, ever since then. So I'll just write it off as we're just special, that's all. That's all. Uh, open your Bibles. Psalm 62. We're going to look at verses 5 through 8. Remember, uh, we need eggs, eggs, and eggs for our community hunt uh, April 3rd. Bring them by the uh, office Wednesday nights. We're back on a regular schedule. And, uh, What do you do with sin? Let me just start by asking you a question. Make a statement and question. You know, you you probably would give verbal assent to the idea that you need God. We all need God. But the tough part of that comes up with do your actions, your attitudes, and your prayer life support that statement. We say we need God. But does it support that? My son gave me a book uh, back in February, The Journey to the Cross. Now, I'm, I'm not a guy that, that, that is, uh, I'm not going to say I don't support Lent but, uh, or the Lenten season, but I don't practice it. Uh, I may practice fasting preparation, but not calling it Lent. And, and the journey to the cross is a 40-day preparation for Easter, and, and particularly focusing on the uh, Lent season. Corey said, Dad, just, just forget the Lent if you can, and focus on the devotion and the thoughts in the book. And that's what I've been doing, and, and, and 
some some marvelous marvelous ideas, uh, thoughts, uh, reflections that he puts within the book. It's uh, written by Paul David Tripp, and uh, and he and he just comes out and he asks that very question about do your actions, your attitude, your prayer support your verbal assent to the idea that we need God, agreement that we need God. And in asking that question, he follows it up with another one. He says, how do you usually respond when you are confronted with your sins? What factors contribute to how you respond at the different times? And we're going to look at four responses that, that we have when we are confronted with our sins. The psalmist David writes as he is fleeing from Absalom. Absalom has taken the throne, has put David on the run. Uh, David is, is, is not just his kingdoms in jeopardy, but his life. And uh, while David is on the run, he pins this, this 62nd psalm and, and mentions a true relief does not come when a problem is resolved because as soon as one problem is resolved, more will be on the way. And this psalm helps us to understand how David, and, and you got to admit with David, and for him, really in his life, he moved from one situation to another situation to another situation. Out in the field, his brother's dogging him when he goes to well, matter of fact, when Samuel's there looking to anoint the next uh, king, David's out in the field while the other seven brothers are at home. And and you have any other sons? He asks Jesse. He goes, oh, yeah, I forgot. I got one more. He's a young one. He's out in the field watching those sheep. When he goes to the battle lines where Goliath's at, his brothers are, are there, and the oldest one is, who's watching those scrawny little sheep of yours that you have? You're here making these big statements. He goes against Goliath, and nobody thinks he has a chance. He goes to Saul's palace and plays the, the, the harp for him to soothe him when that, that, that spirit comes upon him. Twice he's almost pinned to the wall. Saul continues to, to try and, and take David's life while he is is under, under Saul's jurisdiction, his kingship, uh, because he's afraid of David. Remember the song? Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands, and the jealousy enrages him. Once he's in a cave, and Saul comes in, and he has the opportunity to kill. Another time, he goes down into the camp and takes the spear and the water jug and calls out to Saul. Uh, in David's personal life, Michael is taken from him, is given back. And Michael says, you've embarrassed yourself dancing in front of all these people. And David said, I would dance even more and lose all of my dignity for the glory of the Lord. David comes to the situation with Adonijah and, and uh, his David's daughter, Tamar, and how he rapes her and does nothing, and then Absalom kills Adonijah, and, and, and it goes on from there, the family turmoil, to the point to where David finally brought him back from, from isolation, literally, and yet David would not see him. And Absalom ends up usurping the throne. And, and still it does not end because as David's life is drawing away from him, his breath, we see that the throne, there is a battle for the throne between Solomon and his older brother. And the one has taken the throne, declared himself king, and, and Bathsheba goes in, and the, and the prophet follows, and Nathan and says, did you not say that Solomon would be king? Here, your son has declared, and David says, do all this and declare Solomon king, and the people cry out. To where eventually Solomon has that one killed for, for the threat of another attempt of the throne. 
to the marriage of, of his uh, concubine, <clears throat> of David's servant girl. But it gets to this part where, where, where you see one problem just leads to another, and I'm sure nobody in here can relate to that in their life, can they? Where it seems like everything is just falling apart, and just when you get it back together and you think life's good, you go along a little bit, maybe a week, a month, a year, a decade, and bam, it comes again. Something new. We see in this psalm that there's hope that's here. Because let's face it, sin. Sin is something that is an ongoing battle with all of us, isn't it? We all, and, 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 and it seems like when we get one sin under control, conquered, there's three more waiting. Waiting just to come and take their place. Listen to what David writes in 62, the 62nd Psalm, 5th through the 8th verse. My soul waits silently for God alone. My expectation is from him. For he is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Must be a Baptist. I shall not be moved, he says. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is our refuge. Dr. Tripp says about a couple that was in his acquaintance. John and Jimmy, they'd hit a wall again. Misunderstanding had devolved into a nasty name-calling, trust-shattering fight. The air in their house was thick with tension, awkward with silence between them. It was suffocating. It had been three days since the horrible fight. But there had been no reproachment between them. John spent most of those three days telling himself that it was Jenny. She was the problem. And all he was doing was defending himself against her verbal attack. Jenny told herself that she was a victim of an emotionally abusive husband. They could not reconcile because they were unwilling to see their own sin, let alone to confess it to God or one another. Each denied their attitudes and actions. Each excused his or her sin by pointing the finger of blame at one another. And both of them told themselves that what they did wasn't so bad given the circumstances. Unfortunately, this was a very familiar scene for the both of them. It had been repeated again and again. There was never true confession, but somehow they would move on with the wrongs against one another being addressed, and, and, and they'd march on only to find the next debilitating battle. And even more tragic than the toll on their marriage was their denial of their need for rescuing, for forgiving, for empowering grace. Of Jesus. In refusing to confess their sin, they told themselves they did not need the grace of Jesus, purchased for them on the cross of Calvary, because they did not own their sin and cry out to their Savior for his forgiveness and help. They did not grow in grace and love toward Christ nor toward one another. Their marriage was stuck in this vicious cycle of sin and hurt. Kind of a somewhat healing, only to be repeated once again. Cynicism had replaced health. Self-defensiveness had replaced trust and a repeated cycle of hurt-hardened hearts that were once tender and loving, now were not. You know, when we think of these two we think, wow, that's just silly. That's just childish. How could you not see? But it makes sense that you and I, in essence, sometimes do the very same things. We don't reach out for help that we don't think that we need. The three, two words, three words, depending on how you want to say it, that are most damaging to us are, I'm okay. I'm okay. 
When in reality, we're a wreck. When in reality, we're sin-filled. When in reality, we are sin-led. When in reality, we live in a culture that is sin-saturated. And yet we want to say, I'm okay. We don't long for what seems unnecessary. I, 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 I don't need the grace. I'm forgiven. I said my prayer. I'm, I'm living the best life that I, that I can. How is it possible for us to hold on to the cross as, as, as the epicenter of our formal theology, but functionally we're denying our needs for this <clears throat> radical sacrifice of Christ? We agree to the idea we need God, but do our actions reflect it? When you sin as a believer, your conscience is going to bother you. You experience the convicting grace of the Holy Spirit. You realize it's not right. You've done wrong. You shouldn't. But you did, and now, now what? When you sin as a believer, there's only, really only four ways that you can respond. You can only respond to this gracious warning that God has given us through the Holy Spirit. That gracious warning, you've done something wrong. Let's look at these, these four. What are these four? Well, the first one. The first one is what, what do you do when, when that sin is... You excuse it. You make an excuse. You make an excuse. It's hard to admit that you've done something wrong, that it's your responsibility alone. Nobody likes to admit, well, I'm wrong. Yep, I'm wrong. I did it. Shouldn't have done it. I did it. You know, it's amazing. When a police officer pulls you over... You're speeding. Roll down the window. Now, not everybody, but most people. What's the first thing you say? What's the problem, officer? I don't. <laughs> I know. I'm busted. I almost I want to say, <laughs> how much is it? <laughs> uh, one of our local pastors, I won't give you his name or where he's from, but uh, was going through Quentin. And he'd gone into town to pick something up for some work we were doing. And he got right on the edge of town at Quentin where the, where the uh, basketball arena, civic center, whatever you want to call it is. And there was a policeman sitting right there. And uh, guy picked up his phone, looked at it, put it down, and he looked in his mirror. And there were the lights flashing. And he rolled down his window and he said, what's the matter, officer? And the uh, police officer never did say what he pulled him over for, other than he was giving him a ticket that was a deal. It was a deal. And, and the guy was speeding. He was going about three mile an hour over the speed limit. But I think it was the fact he picked up his phone and looked at it, and the officer just saw him with the phone in his hand when he went by. But, what, you know, you knew you blew it. Knew you blew it. I knew one person one time that got pulled over and they said, what is it this time? <laughs> Boy, I'd love to tell, but I'm not going to. But, but we make excuses for our, our, our sin. We don't want to admit it. It's so easy to alleviate our guilt by, by pointing to someone or something else as a reason you did it. I was thinking, what, the speed limit dropped? I didn't know that. Oh, I, I didn't have my seatbelt on? I must have forgot. And then the ding, ding, ding goes off telling you, and it's like, oops, busted. You know, we make excuses. Children are, are novel at this. How many of you have to teach your children to make excuses for doing wrong? I've never had to do that with my kids. They, it was just ingrained, built in, and that's exactly Right, with our sin nature, 
We don't look, look, look at Adam and Eve. What did they say? <laughs> Adam said, It was a chick. Chick goes, It was a snake. The snake goes, You created them, not my problem. He didn't say that, but here's why blame shifting seems so plausible and tempting. You live in a fallen world with broken things all around us. And that being the case, it's not hard to find an excuse, is it? How many of you remember Flip Wilson? Jared, you probably don't remember Flip Wilson. Everybody else in here will remember. <sighs> Feeling older by the day. What did Flip Wilson say? The devil, the devil made me do it. And there's a lot of truth to that. But there's an accountability that goes with it also. Excuses are just right there. You live with, you live near people who are less than perfect. They don't always do the right thing. They don't always have good attitudes. They don't always keep their promises. They're, they are not always committed to your best interest. Why? Because they're just like you. People in need of rescuing. Rescuing. Rescuing of God's grace. But we want to make excuses. We live with all kinds of brokenness. All kinds of brokenness. We live in broken neighborhoods. We drive on broken highways. We are controlled by a broken government. We learn from a broken education system at the stores where we shop. There's, there's brokenness and broken that, and the list can go on and on and on. And in case you hadn't noticed, this isn't paradise. This isn't paradise. Now, that doesn't give us a reason, but it gives us a cause. But we succumb to the cause. This isn't paradise. This is where we're at till we reach paradise. Now, how do we live in it? What do we do with it? And you know, in all of this, this, this that we live in, the brokenness, we see that God greets us. He's still there to greet us with his heart, his life-changing, his empowering grace. It really is possible to do right in a world that's full of so much wrong, that's so broken. This life of right begins by recognizing your need for God's grace. And it begins with a, a, a commitment to not to deny yourself the need of God's grace. You know, that's for those people over there. They really need God's grace. We all need God's grace. Paul quotes the psalmist. Is there any that's righteous? No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And we need God's grace. And searching for excuses for the wrong that you've done only denies the need for that grace. You know, people say God makes mistakes. Can I tell you? God knows everything from alpha to omega, beginning to end. He knew everything before Genesis and he knows everything after Revelation. And he still made you. I want you to think about that a minute. He still made you. And I got to tell you, that stops me in my tracks. He knew all the wrong that I was going to do, and yet he still made me. And I would dare make an excuse for sinning and not wanting that grace. Second, second thing that, that we do when we're confronted with our sins is we just deny it. We just deny it. It's all so tempting to rewrite certain parts of history to make ourselves look more righteous than we actually are. 
this may sound needlessly repetitive, but it's, I, I think it's worth saying again. The ultimate denial of sin is denial. The ultimate denial of sin is denial. Saying that it never happened, so it makes you hopelessly unapproachable. We convince ourselves if it didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen, well, it must not have happened. And all you're doing is fooling yourself. Because I ask you this, those around you, do they know what happened? They don't know all the details, but do they know what happened? Yeah. And you're going to deny it, you're going to make excuses for it, and it does nothing. Nothing. It makes you hopeless. It never happened. It makes you hopelessly unapproachable. It's resistant to the thought that you need to change. It's almost like you're congratulating yourself because you should feel guilty and you don't. How can I feel guilty if I didn't do anything wrong? God's forgiving, restoring, Enabling grace is needed by everybody. And to deny that you sin is just denying that you need grace. And that grace that God gave, must his son dying on a cross must have been a mistake because you don't need it. And if you don't need it, then why did Christ have to die? Denial never goes anywhere good. It's never good for your heart. It never deepens your relationship with God. It never produces good in your relationships. Why would we want to? Excuse it, deny it. If I denied it, it didn't happen. You know, if I crunch my truck, I can deny it didn't happen. And all I have to do is go out and look at the spot. I got a black pickup truck with the door of it's dented up. I backed into Durek's dump trailer. When Kevin was building his house, I was too busy watching over here instead of over here. And, and I'm backing up and all at once I hear, you know, metal scraping and I stop and I look at it and I thought, that's not going to be good. So I pull forward, and sure enough, I got three little racing stripes right on the door. I could have made excuses and said, well, I couldn't see it. It was my blind spot. I could have denied, well, that didn't happen, and all I have to do is stick my head out the door, and I know that it happened because I can look at it and see. And you know how I know that I need grace? All I have to do is look at an empty cross, and it reminds me, I need grace. And you know why I need grace? Because Christ died on a cross. Do you know why Christ died on a cross? Because I'm not perfect, and I sin. And I can make any excuse that I want. I can deny it all I want. But when I stand before God, all the books will be opened up, and only one book matters. It's my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's no excuse I can give for it not being there. There's no denial I can make that it should be there that's going to hold water my fault and mine alone. But I can look at that empty cross and I'm reminded that it's for me that he died. We can excuse, we can make excuses for it, we can deny it, and thirdly, we can minimize it. We can minimize, oh, it's not that bad. And here is where I think the, the, the church universally is today. Now, when I say universal church, don't go crazy on me and think I'm going one road, or all roads lead to, no, no. I'm saying a, a, a evangelical, Bible-believing Christian church, if we're somewhere today, I think right here it is. We minimize it. One of the most tempting ways of escaping responsibility for our sin is not to excuse, not to deny it, but to minimize it. Wrong becomes more palatable when... You are able to minimize sin's size, sin's importance, and sin's impact. Size, importance, and impact. It was just a little sin. It wasn't that big of a deal. It didn't hurt anybody but me. 
And there you go again. I, me, my, mine. It's my life. I'll live it the way I want. It's not hurting anybody. If it's hurting anybody, it's just hurting me. When you're able to make your sin look something less than a conscience, moral rebellion against God, a willingness to do wrong to your neighbor for your own good, it doesn't feel so wrong to you. Well, I mean, you know, at least it's not as bad as the town drunk. It's not as bad as a rapist or a murderer or someone who's embezzling or someone who's not being faithful in their marriage or someone else who's got a pile of speeding tickets this high or a DUI. It's not like I never go to church. It's not like I never read my Bible. It's not like I never go to Sunday school. It's not like I never go to Bible study. It's not like I don't tithe or support the church or the ministries of the church. It's not like I don't pray. We can minimize all of that and say, I know God will forgive me for it. And when you're minimizing sin, can I tell you what else you just did? You just minimize the price of forgiveness. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Let's say, let's say, but it's legal. They made it legal. How can it be wrong if it's legal? Oh, there's many things that happen in life that are not wrong as far as the law goes, but according to God's law, there's much wrong with it. <laughs> Much. And whenever we minimize sin and the effect of sin and the fact that we sin, when we minimize it, we minimize the fact that we need grace. And we all need grace. We all need Jesus. And you're going to say, well, I need Jesus. I just don't need that much of Jesus. Can I tell you? I can't get enough of Jesus. I'm not a bad guy. I don't beat my wife. She'll beat me back. No, I don't beat my wife. I don't beat my kids. I don't cheat people. I don't, and I can go on and on, but you know what? I can tell you there are sins in my life that I have. I have the thoughts. I may not verbalize how I feel, but I'm thinking of, of, of the anger inside of me. I'm thinking... What do I read? What do I watch? What do, what do my words say when I do? Do I say hurt, hurtful words? Do my words build up other people? Do they tear them down? Can I say to that person what I'm saying to someone else about them? There are sins that I have to repent for. And listen, whether it's a big sin or a little sin, God doesn't look at it that way. How does he look at it? Sin. And when I minimize it, I minimize the price. Christ paid. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. This is David, a man after God's own heart. But I'm not sure I want to pattern my life after him. He's got some things that I, I think are kind of questionable. But man, the thing is, whenever David, when it was brought to his attention, you know what David did? Oh, Lord, against you, you only have I sinned. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me with hyssop. Make me whiter than snow. David repented. I want to be like David. I want to know God on an intimate basis like that to minimize the sins that we have. Minimizes the need that we have. So we can excuse it. We can deny it. We can minimize it. But there's one more thing that we can do and that we should do and that I think David is telling us to do in these, in these four verses that are here. What is that? We need to confess our sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the having, and having done... In, in, in the face of having done what's wrong in, in, in the eyes of God, this truly is the only option that the cross of Jesus Christ leaves open. If sin is excluded, if it's excusable, if it's deniable, if it's not really a big deal, we minimize it, then the cross of Christ, as I just said, 
It's not necessary. Confession always recognizes the inescapable sinfulness of sin. Sin cannot be excused, it cannot be denied, and it cannot be minimized. And it's not honest to diminish its significance. <laughs> you know what sin has to be done? It has to be owned. It has to be confessed to the one who has the power not only to forgive but to deliver us from that hold, that grip of sin that it has on our hearts, that it has in our lives. I go back again. We have to own it and confess it. When David realized the sin against Uriah, against Bathsheba, and ultimately against God, David said it, against you only have I sinned. And he begged for forgiveness. What is confession? Confession is admitting personal responsibility for your words and your actions without excuse of any kind or shifting the blame to anyone. Well, God, I did it. But you know, if I hadn't have been over here with this guy, if I hadn't have listened to, if I hadn't have watched, if I hadn't have read, if I hadn't of, that's not confession. Confession is without excuse or the shifting of blame. Confession is a welcome into a deeper appreciation of the presence, the promise, and the grace that God gives us. It is a welcome to a more humble, more honest, more approachable, more loving relationship, not only with God, but with others. Henry Blackaby says, if you have a sin problem, you have a God problem. You have a God problem. Because sin is against God. It's a welcome to no longer being afraid of knowing yourself or being known because you know that nothing will ever be known or revealed about you that hasn't already been covered by the blood of Jesus, by the promise. Confession is an invitation to a life of eternal, internal rest and eternal rest peace. Internal rest, eternal peace. So we can give verbal agreement to the idea that we need God. But do our actions reflect it? Do our actions make excuses? Do they make deniability? Do they minimize? Or do they make confession? How do you usually respond when you're confronted with your sin? Put your head in the sand, think it'll go away? You just made an excuse. You denied it, actually. You just denied it. If I don't see it, it's not there. Remember as a kid, someone saying something, not listening, no, 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 no. And you know every word that they're saying. And so does God. What... Uh, what have you noticed are the effects of each of these responses? What happens when you make, make excuses? What happens when you make, ex uh, when, you, when you make excuses, when you deny, when you minimize? I'm okay. It's not that big a deal. Or make confession. What are the effects? I think the first three is going to be a continued guilt. I think the first and fourth one, confession, is going to bring overwhelming peace. You know, you get ready and go out this week. Two weeks, it's Easter. Wow, doesn't seem possible. Two weeks, it's Easter. So as you prepare for Easter and you look at a deep reflection within your heart and with your life, how do you handle sin? What it's brought to your attention. Excuse, deny, minimize, or confess. 
prepare your heart for Easter to find the confession that needs to come. In God is my salvation, my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. <laughs> Confess. God is a refuge for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder. Sin is always at our door, creeping around the next corner, waiting to find its next victim. And Lord, we can't think of ourselves as being victimless. Sin's at our door, our corners, our world. When sin comes in, we, we fall short. We don't have the strength. And you bring it to our attention through your Holy Spirit. I pray that we would be big enough and brave enough to confess it. Prepare our hearts for this Easter as it comes. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday night.